Like any weird kid who was obsessed with spooky things, I grew up extremely enamored with the Winchester Mystery House located in San Jose, California. If you were like me and were super into ghost adventures, you may also remember it from one of their episodes. Sarah Winchester, heir of the Winchester fortune, had San Jose construction crews working round the clock 365 days a year because a psychic told her that she had to keep building in order to confuse all of the angry spirits that were killed by the Winchester Rifles. This sprawling, beautiful, and incredibly odd Victorian mansion is legendary and for good reason. Not just due to its strange architecture and labyrinthine hallways, doors that lead nowhere, stairs that lead to ceilings, etc., but due to the story surrounding the house and its mysterious designer and owner, Sarah L. Winchester. The legend goes that Sarah, who was the heiress to the Winchester rifle fortune, was haunted until death by the souls of every person killed by a Winchester gun. These ghosts drove her mad, and she supposedly spent the rest of her life endlessly building this mansion, now known as the Winchester Mystery House, making it as convoluted and nonsensical as possible in order to confuse the ghosts. Growing up, I assumed that at least part of this was true, or that Sarah herself must have believed it. A few days ago, I asked you guys on Twitter and Instagram whether you'd been to the Mystery House, and if you had, whether or not you'd seen a ghost. Of those of you who have been, about 10% have seen a ghost. For the love of God, if you're one of these people, please comment below and tell me about your mystery house ghost sighting. <laughs> but as it turns out, the Winchester Mystery House has a lot less to do with ghosts than we're led to believe. Sarah Winchester of legend, truthfully, has very little to do with the real woman. So if not due to ghosts, why does the house look the way it does? Where did the legend even come from? And what, truthfully, was Sarah Winchester really like? Come learn with me. Just a quick disclaimer though, for obvious reasons, we'll be discussing the history of guns and their role in the brutality of the Old West. Basically a continuation from the last video. If that's a tough topic for you, please keep that in mind. But first, let's hear a brief word from today's sponsor, Atlas VPN. With hacking attempts, data breaches, and other online dangers forever rising, you really gotta look into protecting your cybersecurity as best you can. A VPN is the perfect place to start. Atlas VPN encrypts your data and hides your virtual location so your device gets a new IP and DNS address. Your internet traffic gets encrypted, sent off to the VPN server, and then decrypted and shipped off to its destination, which not only keeps you safe, but also protects your privacy and personal info from prying eyes. Not to mention, there's a lot more that Atlas VPN can do for you other than just protecting your privacy. You can stream at high speeds, protect an unlimited number of devices, block ads and malware, and of course, save money while online shopping or booking travel because websites can't bump the prices based on your location. Also, Atlas VPN has this super handy data breach tracking tool, so you can see if your emails have been caught up in any data breaches, giving you the peace of mind that you'll never be caught unawares. Atlas VPN works on any device and comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee for all subscription purchases, so you can try it out and see if you like it. Right now, Atlas VPN is running a huge discount. It means you can get a three-year subscription for just $1.99 a month with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Time is running out, so get your deal by clicking the link in the description below so you can start exploring the internet knowing that your privacy is protected. Thank you so much to Atlas VPN for sponsoring this video, and now let's get back to learning the truth about the Winchester Mystery House. The Winchester fortune, oddly enough, didn't begin in arms dealing. It began in shirt manufacturing. Sarah's later husband, William Winchester, was the son of Oliver Winchester, who co-founded the Winchester and Davies shirt manufactory in the mid-1800s. In fact, many years later, when Sarah Winchester went on to build the mystery house, contrary to popular belief, it was the shirt manufacturing fortune that funded most of the house's renovations and construction. In the 1860s, though, Oliver Winchester sought to expand his business ventures and invested into the Volcanic Repeating Arms Company, which had invented a revolutionary repeating revolver with volcanic firing power. Remember, in this time period, guns were very different than they are today. They were tedious and time-consuming to load, which could easily get you killed in a situation like war, especially for a majority of new recruits who were frightened and less experienced. Sarah Winchester's brother-in-law, Homer Sprague, wrote of his experience in battle, nothing is more difficult than to load and fire advancing without breaking into hopeless confusion. Here, the rigid drill 
thrilling we had received and the perfect confidence we had in our success sustained us notwithstanding the shower of missiles that drove in our faces. Our 500 men were in the midst of 3,000 rebels. All seemed lost. With the Civil War looming on the horizon, this was of greater concern than ever. The Volcanic Repeating Arms Company was poorly managed though and swiftly succumbed to its debts, at which point Oliver Winchester smartly used his investments to pay off said debts and take over, renaming it the New Haven Arms Company after New Haven, Connecticut, where the Winchester family lived. Oliver brought in a mechanic from his shirt factory named Benjamin Henry to design something new for NHAC, the world's first repeating rifle, which could fire 15 shots in just 10 seconds, something unheard of at the time. As war drew ever nearer, Oliver Winchester was seeing the dollar signs in arms dealing and, armed with these new Henry rifles, began pursuing government contract deals with the Union Army. It was a hard sell at first, though. Many generals were deeply concerned about the brutality that more advanced machinery would bring, and rightly so. The Civil War would be fought primarily with single-shot muskets and rifles, but the other war on American soil, the hidden one taking place in the West, was a war of Winchester repeaters. Here's where things got dramatic. While overseas in Europe trying to sign arms deals, Oliver Winchester made the unbelievably doo-doo-brained mistake of signing over power of attorney in the company to Benjamin Henry, who didn't even like him. While Winchester was away, Henry filed with the Connecticut State Legislature to reincorporate NHAC as the Henry Repeating Rifle Company, effectively committing mutiny and overthrowing Winchester. But while Winchester had forgotten that Henry hated his guts, Henry had forgotten that Winchester just happened to be a good businessman. Winchester withdrew all of his money from the company and established the new Winchester Repeating Arms Company, leaving Henry's enterprise dead in the water with no cash. The next year, Winchester offered to pay off the Henry Repeating Rifle Company's debts and once again owned the company, leaving Henry effectively exiled. It wasn't long before the Henry Rifles were known permanently in public memory as Winchester Rifles. Oliver wasn't satisfied with this victory victory, though. His main goal was acquiring government arms contracts and surpassing the massive legacy left behind by Samuel Colt before him, the owner but not inventor of Colt revolvers, known as the P.T. Barnum of the arms industry. If Colt was a bloodthirsty businessman, and he was, Winchester wanted to be bloodthirstier. <laughs> when the Civil War ended, there was a steep fall in the gun market, but coincidentally, that's also exactly when the Transcontinental Railroad was completed in 1869 and, once again, Oliver started seeing the dollar signs. He established an office in San Francisco and began building a large clientele of people working on ships and the docks and, later, expanding to American settlers and Native Americans. Much like Samuel Colt before him, Oliver Winchester had no qualms selling firearms to both sides of a conflict. But the Winchester rifles undoubtedly skewed in favor of the colonizing settlers and the subsequent violence that they enacted upon the native population, often advertising the rifles with dehumanizing language like one that read, For Indian, bear, or buffalo hunting, the Winchester rifle is unrivaled. As the American government pushed more and more to trap Native Americans into reservations, often cutting off their access to food supply chains and the areas they previously would have hunted, the growing dilemma of hunger pushed Native Americans to begin stockpiling Winchester guns, calling them spirit guns because they kept firing. The Winchester guns were used in many Native revolts and battles and were also fired back at them from the other side. Untouched by the bloodshed, Oliver Winchester made a lot of money. The government not only finally began supplying repeaters to its troops, but also supplying the guns for free to settlers heading west and to some cowboys. The Winchester rifles were also popularized in the hands of Buffalo Bill Cody, whose traveling Wild West shows popularized a mythologized image of cowboys and what people came to believe the West was like. Check out my last video to learn more about that. The first of these shows opened in 1883, featuring Buffalo Bill swinging around his Winchester rifle and proclaiming it as a boss for Indian fighting. The legend of the Winchester rifle was growing as it established itself as the icon of the West, in the hands of everyone involved. For years, the rifle was viewed in the light of glory, the tool of white American settlers claiming what they believed was their right to own. 
but no amount of glory won in bloodshed lasts forever, and it wouldn't take long for people's consciences to catch up with them. From the 1880s onwards, more and more books and articles would be published that exposed the violence against Native Americans, as well as the violence towards white settlers by other white settlers. Though much of the population obviously had little sympathy for Native Americans, a good number did and openly criticized this treatment. More commonly, though, many people weren't yet willing to fully come to terms with white American complacency in Native genocide and the ideologies that drove it, and instead shifted the blame onto the Winchester Rifles themselves. In reality, both should have been blamed. The Winchester Company openly enabled violence for profit, but it's also true that the public used the Winchester name as a replacement target for their own racial guilt rather than turning it inwards. Unfortunately, though, that guilt only went so far. By 1919, the mythologized image of the glorious Old West had firmly implanted itself in the American identity, and the Winchester Company began to advertise its rifles as the gun that won the West, and the public didn't look back. Through all this, Sarah and her husband William Winchester undoubtedly profited, while Sarah mostly participated from the sidelines, as most wives of rich men did in those days. Sarah Winchester herself had almost no part in the rifles, or how they won the West, but they became her legacy more than anyone else anyway, almost purely because she accidentally attracted a lot of attention long after she inherited the Winchester fortune. But that comes much later, and to understand why she attracted so much attention, we need to get to know her first. Sarah Winchester was born Sarah Lockwood Pardee in New Haven, Connecticut in 1839 to Leonard Pardee and Sarah Burns. She had five sisters, one of which died in infancy, and one brother. The family coincidentally moved to the same street as the Winchester family around the 1850s, and the two households became incredibly close. Because Leonard was a carpenter, Sarah grew up surrounded by talented craftsmen and woodworkers and was deeply fascinated by their work, something that she would carry with her her whole life. Leonard Pardee was keen to hop on the blossoming Victorian design trends and ornamentation, bringing the distinct style of the era to New Haven's homes and growing his wealth tremendously. He and the rest of the Pardee family also held pointedly progressive beliefs for the time, raising their children with an open-mindedness that would allow them to lead unorthodox Orthodox lives in whatever manner they chose. Sarah Winchester, though a clearly reserved and modest woman, was deeply influenced by these ideals. Sarah met William Wirt Winchester in their childhood as neighbors. Long before William's father entered the arms business, William grew up assuming that he would take over the Winchester shirt factory business. William had always been in rather poor health and was not quite as strong-willed as Oliver, but he was raised to be the successor to the fortune regardless. Personality-wise, he and Sarah were a good match and by the 1860s, they had begun courting. They married in 1862 in the midst of the Civil War, which William was far too ill to fight in. In 1863, tragically struck the family when William's sister Annie died, well, died in childbirth. Her infant son died 19 days later, following the simultaneous tragic death of her other two-year-old son. The triple deaths hit the family hard, and it became quickly apparent that Sarah and William would not be establishing their family far away. In fact, they remained living in the Winchester house, which originally was only going to be temporary. Sarah herself became pregnant in 1865, both a joyous occasion and an incredibly tense one, after the last pregnancy in the same house went so badly. The next year, Sarah gave birth successfully to a baby girl named Annie, honoring Annie Dye. You didn't think things were going to stay happy, right? This is the Victorian era. The infant mortality rate was not good. Poor little Annie Pardee Winchester struggled to feed and keep food down and was diagnosed with marasmus. Only a month old, the baby starved to death. Sarah and William, overwhelmed with grief, retreated into seclusion. Only a few years later, Sarah lost her father, Leonard Pardee. A trend was being set. Death and mourning would follow Sarah closely through her whole life. In the years following, though, she was never directly involved in her husband and father-in-law's business dealings. Sarah began paying close attention, though, to how they managed the business and dealt with finances as well as the real estate management and acquisition. The Winchester family decided decided to design and build an expansive and luxurious new home in New Haven, of which Sarah and William took a major hand in overseeing. 
it was a prime opportunity to focus on something other than their grief over their baby. By the time the home was completed, the couple have become thoroughly enchanted by architecture and construction. It's a good thing, too, that Sarah had discovered a passion that helped her cope with grief, because 1880 to 81 would prove to be the roughest year of her life. In May 1880, Sarah lost her mother. In December, Oliver Winchester died. And in March 1881, William Winchester died of his longtime tuberculosis. The three people most important in her life all disappeared in a span of 10 months. All at once, Sarah found herself deeply grieving once more and also suddenly extremely wealthy. She inherited a good amount of money from her mother's estate, divided up to the siblings. From Oliver and subsequently William, she inherited thousands and thousands of shares of stocks and bonds, as well as real estate and a $300,000 trust. Sarah had never been interested in the arms business and so control over the Winchester Repeating Arms Company fell to other trusted people instead. She got financial consultations as best she could, dealt with the funerals, and then retreated to the seaside to grieve in peace. A short while later, Sarah decided against staying in New Haven's high society wifey circles and began planning her new life out west in California. By this time, California was being hyped up across the nation in books, magazines, and brochures, as well as the railway system, as the place to be, with its beautiful landscape, cheap real estate, and desirable weather. It seemed like just the place for a woman with a lot of money to make a new life. Sarah also invited her her sisters Belle and Estelle to come with her along with their families and their older sister Nettie, who was going there anyway with her family. The minute Sarah set eyes on the Santa Clara Valley, she was in love. Together, the sisters and their families began to put down roots in what is now San Jose. Unfortunately, and I'm sure you could see this coming from a mile away, it wasn't long until tragedy struck. Having suffered the pain of a failed marriage, Estelle had become an addict to something that took a toll on her liver. She passed away suddenly in 1894. Belle moved out with her family, and Sarah helped her renovate their new home, reintroducing her to her passion for home design. Sarah desperately wanted to run wild with her creative passion, and truthfully, now she had all the time, money, and freedom in the world to do just that. But her passion, considered odd for a society woman at the time, would attract confusion from others. Confusion, and later, ridicule and lies. Sarah Winchester is commonly thought of as a woman so stricken with grief that it drove her mad. A lot of supporting details with this idea place her having seances to contact her dead William or baby Annie, or consulting mediums to contact them instead. An insinuator flat out say that this is something that made her a weirdo who was obsessed with death and could never get past the deaths of her family. But as I discussed in my video about ghost hunting, this time period was a time when trying to commune with the dead was incredibly common common, and it was not at all seen as anything strange. It was incredibly normal for people to seek out mediums or other methods of spirit communication to try and connect with their dearly departed loved ones. It didn't make them strange, it meant that they were reaching towards means other than traditional religious methods to deal with grief. And at the time, these methods were extremely new, so it was seen as an incredibly scientific and forward-thinking thing to do. In an era following the Civil War, when every person in the country had been touched by death in some way, it's only natural that the old religious pillars just couldn't hold that weight anymore. People craved something tangible, and ghostly communication was seen as wholly rational, especially in the social class of women that Sarah belonged to. That said, we actually have no hard evidence that Sarah ever visited any mediums or held seances. Many articles and books report that she visited some specific medium, but there's no evidence of the guy even existing. Either way, if she did, it wouldn't have made her odd. What we know Sarah did do, though, was translate her emotions into architectural creativity. In 1886, Sarah had purchased a two-story farmhouse on Los Gatos Road. Sarah Winchester loved the great late Victorian fairs and exhibitions, and so would buy beautiful things from these fairs to decorate her home or recreate simple parts of the fairs on her property so she could enjoy picnics and teas there with her sisters. The internationally inspired gardens at these fairs prompted Sarah to recreate cultural gardens of her own, studying architectural journals, 
scribbling plans and ideas, consulting with various builders, Sarah's extravagant design habits are reflective of a very wealthy woman during the infamously ornamented Gilded Age who had nothing to lose and wanted nothing more than to curate her own nest. This meant that she could change her mind frequently. She often would have things torn down or redone if she ended up not liking them, or start on a completely different idea out of nowhere. She created her plans in disjointed sections rather than a cohesive whole, which is why the mystery house today is so confusing and labyrinthine. Not because she was trying to confuse the ghosts, but because she simply didn't care to plan as a bigger picture. Winchester herself went on to describe her home as rambling. <laughs> To be honest though, if you've ever been inside an untouched old Victorian home, you know that just in general, homes in that era can just be maze-like by nature, and it's tough to get a grip on where you are in the floor plan. The homes were literally just made up of a ton of squished together connected rooms. Part of the reasoning for this was not accidental. It was incredibly effective for climate control. In a time before electric heating or AC, it was much easier to heat or cool a smaller room than a huge swamp of a house. In a small room in winter, it's easy to close a door and run the fireplace and you're toasty in no time. In summer, you can open a window and it takes much less time for the small room to cool off. It just makes sense for the time, but to modern sensibilities, it comes off as cluttered and confusing. This commonality means that it was incredibly common for people whose home was their artistic pet project to create, in the end, a home that was completely buck wild and bizarre. Sarah was not the exception, she was one of many. Sarah Winchester used this house as her creative outlet. It was like a massive thing that she could constantly change or reconfigure, add on to, or take something away. It was calming and entertaining for her, and it was fun to tackle all the new challenges that it brought, from perfecting the plumbing to the heating to having electricity installed. She came up with ways that the house could recycle and reuse water. Sarah wrote in a letter of how frustrating the process could be, but still remaining dedicated. I am constantly having to make upheaval for some reason. For instance, my upper hall, which leads to the sleeping apartment, was rendered so unexpectedly dark by a little addition that after a number of people had missed their footing on the stairs, I decided that safety demanded something to be done, so over a year ago, I took out a wall and put in a skylight. Then I became rather worn and tired out and dismissed all the workmen to take such rest as I might through the winter. This spring, I recalled the carpenters, hoping to get my hall finished up. Rain revealed to my dismay leaks in the new skylight. And so it goes. Contrary to the belief today that Winchester worked her contractors constantly without end, she would routinely excuse them for long periods of rest. And in fact, she had no work done on the house after 1906. Of course, the house began attracting widespread attention as the years drew on and construction continued. But after she refused to be hostess to two different US presidents upon their visits to the area, people started thinking she was odd. Although, the second one was Teddy Roosevelt, and frankly, he didn't give a shit about staying there either in the first place. <laughs> All Sarah wanted was some damn privacy. But unfortunately, when you're a widowed woman building a huge house at the turn of the century, you're bound to attract unwanted attention. As Mary Jo and Yofo writes in Captive at the Labyrinth, neighbors who wished to know her or have access to her were rebuffed. To the local people, she was an enigma. They did not know what to make of her. Eventually, they just made fun. If there's one thing we can say about journalism in the late Victorian era and the early 1900s, it's that oftentimes, Journalists cared about entertainment above all else. If you go look at Victorian newspapers, you can see that many of the stories are purely gossip or unconfirmed rumors or straight up tall tales. It's no wonder that the press latched on to Sarah Winchester as a new target in 1895 and never let go. Because she was so private, it was easy for people to assign random juicy motivations to her and her ever-growing home. First, they said she was highly superstitious, then that she was snobbish, then that she feared death, and then that she was consumed with guilt over the deaths at the hands, or rather bullets, of Winchester rifles. After the 1906 San Francisco earthquake, a pivotal moment in this story, people took the leap to calling her crazy and saying that she was genuinely haunted by ghosts and was obsessed with occult practices. One early article wrote, The belief exists when work of construction ends, disaster will result. And it is rumored among the neighbors that this superstition has resulted in the construction of domes, turrets, cupolas, and towers covering the territory enough for a castle. Sarah wasn't without her defenders, though. One local told the press, If people come here with fortunes and are inclined 
inclined to spend it, I do not think it is wise to circulate reports that they are cranks merely because they do not get thick with the neighbors. It didn't take long for people to begin using Sarah Winchester as an outlet for their distaste for the Winchester rifles. Now, it's not my place to say whether or not Sarah Winchester should have felt guilty for profiting off of the company. Truthfully, she didn't have any say in the matter, and she's not the one who invented it nor sold it. Nor did she ever care about the company, though it is undeniable that the repeaters were a keystone of damage and death in the conquest of the American West, and still she profited heavily. It's a wholly complicated situation that I don't think has a clear answer. Regardless, what can be said for certain is that, righteously or not, Sarah Winchester was not haunted by guilt over the deaths caused by Winchester rifles, nor was she haunted by their ghosts. But it didn't help that she adamantly refused to make public statements and never tried to defend herself against any rumors. So as time drew on, it seemed that Sarah was allowing herself to become the target for other people's gun guilt. On April 18th, 1906, around five 5 a.m., a, a 7.8 magnitude earthquake befell San Francisco. It was utterly cataclysmic. Over 3,000 people were killed, and the property damage was already bad. And then the quake started massive fires that tore through the region, and it got even worse. Conversely, in Campbell, horrible flooding was caused when two 60,000 gallon water tanks collapsed. The Winchester mansion didn't escape unscathed. Many parts of the house were completely destroyed, the rest of it brutally damaged. After two decades of careful and loving planning and construction, it must have been devastating for Sarah to look at her house in shambles and imagine having to start over. She thought about raising the whole thing, but in the end, decided against it. Rather than rebuilding the thing, she opted to clear the ruins and rubble, mostly repair what was left, and ignore the rest. This is the reason why the house today is so strange. Stairways that lead to ceilings and doors that lead nowhere, hallways that don't make any sense, it all goes back to the quake of 1906 and Sarah's decision to leave her house mostly unfixed. Those doors that lead to nowhere once led to balconies or other wings of the house. The stairs once had somewhere to go. Some chimneys were sealed into the ceilings, rendering them unusable. Sarah herself said of her house in the quake's aftermath, it looks as though it had been built by a crazy person. What became lost to time is that the house, in fact, isn't a testament to a paranoid, superstitious woman. It's a testament to a natural disaster. If anything, it was the quake and the press and local treatment of her that truly disheartened Sarah Winchester. Stories began popping up more and more, detailing how her house is haunted by hundreds of angry spirits, but she fears and yet defies them in every decision she makes. In response, Sarah put up large hedges around the property to block people's view. It must be said that the people who never once believed Sarah to be mad or superstitious or strange were all the people who knew her personally. Her family and friends, the contractors building the house, her attorneys, the people who lived and worked on the property. Winchester hired a large number of Japanese and some Chinese workers to live and work on the property with their families as gardeners and landscapers, as well as dressers and maids to assist her in her old age as her health began to fail. Many of these families lived much of their lives in the Winchester properties, having children there. In 1913, the gardener Tommy Nishihara's granddaughter was born there, and she was named Ida Winchester Nishihara. In this era, Winchester hiring non-white gardeners and dressers, and paying them twice as much as they would have been paid elsewhere, earned her a lot of suspicion and scorn from other white upper-class families. Rumors spread that she was performing strange rituals with her workers. Honestly, with her health as bad as it was by this point, I don't think she was up for rituals of any kind. In 1922, her body destroyed by years of rheumatoid arthritis, Sarah Winchester began making arrangements to prepare for her imminent death. She tied up her finances, paid her workers, said her goodbyes. On September 5th, Sarah Winchester passed away in bed. In the end, much of her fortune ended up going to the William Wirt Winchester Hospital that she had established in New Haven to honor her late husband. By the next year, the Winchester house had been leased by John and Mame Brown, who saw a great business opportunity in marketing the mansion as well. 
the Mystery House. They started inviting in journalists for tours, and things avalanched from there. They claimed that Sarah's favorite number was 13, but the things pointed out in the house to prove this were all added or amended to make it so after Winchester's death. In fact, a lot of the strangest parts of the house were added after her death much to the fury of the still surviving people who knew her. Despite their best efforts, they were never able to stop the runaway train that was the myth of crazy old Sarah Winchester. I really hope that you don't take this video as me trying to destroy the magic of the Winchester Mystery House. The thing is, I care deeply about historical misinformation and the ways that it affects the true legacies of real people. Sarah Winchester, after all, wasn't a character in a horror dime novel. She was a real woman who lived a really fascinating life and left us with an incredible house that is truly a testament to the eccentricities and beauty of Victorian architecture. When I visited the Winchester Mystery House, as a kid, I didn't see any ghosts, but what I did see was an immensely breathtaking house. That visit was the beginning of my own personal infatuation with Victorian architecture. I can only dream of someday owning a house with a fraction of its beauty and nothing close to its size. Sarah Winchester herself was a truly interesting person, even without the tall tales about her supposed guilt and haunting and despair. She was someone who asked for nothing but privacy, but wasn't given that because in budding California society, privacy is too much for an eccentric woman to ask for. I understand why the Mystery House leans so hard into the Winchester spooky legend. It's what brings in tourists and cash, and that's what allows them to make the money that they need to upkeep the house. And trust me, it is not cheap to upkeep old Victorian homes, even the really fancy, well-constructed ones. You'll notice if you take a tour there, and I highly recommend that you do, they don't state parts of the spooky ooky story as fact. Christy Tiny Dooms on TikTok used to work at the Winchester Mystery House as a tour guide and had some really interesting insight into how the house uses the legend. Anyone who comes to the Winchester House is told what the legend is. Depending on who they speak to, they also get the actual history. Many guides will focus on the history, the architecture of the house, and Mrs. Winchester's life as we have record of it, and others will focus solely on the, um, the story, the legend. In the case of ghost adventures and ghost hunters and uh, BuzzFeed Unsolved and all of these ghost hunting paranormal shows, they get the official historian and she is obligated to give the legend only. So you'll notice if she's talking to the camera, she'll say, well, the legend has it and the story goes and that's what they say. And it's quietly killing her that she can't tell them the truth. At this point, the myth of ghosts and seances is inextricably linked to Sarah Winchester's story. It needs to be included. I just wish that the truths of her life weren't so frequently excluded at the same time. I like to shout out a specific source that I used when it gets referenced extensively, so for this video, the most valuable source that I had was Mary Jo and Yofo's Captive of the Labyrinth. This book is full of amazing info on the Winchesters as well as California history, so definitely give it a read to learn more. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you at the end of next month. Sorry my video schedule is halved, I'm in the trenches right now working on my graphic novel, so I expect things to get back to normal in a couple months or so. Click the link in the description or pinned comment below to get a three-year subscription to Atlas VPN for just $1.99 a month. Hop on that soon because this deal won't last forever. Until next time, wash thy hands, wear thy mask, and watch out for those doorways to nowhere. Uh -huh.